Hello, Bondola. Come on, Achen. We are so excited to be here with our very special guest, Aaron Ra. And we are, we are also uh, highly, highly honored. And as uh, we were talking in the backstage a little while ago, that um, uh, people from their part of the world do not know, uh, probably do not know um, that we have a country uh, over here. And we have atheists over here. Might be a surprise to a lot of them. And also, um, a lot of people from our country don't know where Texas is. <laughs> and that's no surprise. All right, so with that, uh, let's uh, move into your presentation. So it's all you, Aaron. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the biggest issue I have with explaining evolution to, to someone is getting over their misconceptions about what it is, what it isn't. Unless otherwise specified, when scientists use the word evolution, they are referring to the one and only scientific explanation of biodiversity. Uh, summarily defined as descent with inherent modification. Paraphrased for clarity, that is a process of varying allele frequencies among reproductive populations, leading to usually subtle changes in the morphological or physiological composition of descendant subsets. When compiled over several generations, uh, these can expand biodiversity when continuing variation between genetically isolated groups eventually lead to one or more descendant branches increasingly distinct from their ancestors or cousins. And I'll explain what all of that gobbledygook means in just a moment. Evolution is not the origin of life, nor does it have anything at all to do with the origin of the universe or anything else. Neither is evolution a mere belief like religion is. In fact, we've been relying on evolutionary principles throughout the entire history of agriculture or animal husbandry and disease control, even though we've only recently begun to learn uh, what those principles are and why they work. Importantly, getting into the history of it, because this matters too. In 1735, a Swedish botanist named Carl Linn, more famously known as Carolus Linnaeus, devised taxonomy a means of classifying all known life forms systematically. And this was a this was hundred years before Darwin and even decades before Lamarck. So Linnaeus had no concept of evolution. I mean, that, that evolution hadn't been described by any means to that point. Uh, and Linnaeus himself was a Christian and a creationist, but he noticed that everything in his taxonomic system was in a nested hierarchical series or hierarchical series of daughter groups descending from a lineage of parent categories who are themselves siblings of several generations or ranks of earlier ancestral classifications. What he saw was the branching pattern of a family tree, and this was wholly inconsistent with his belief in divine design, and he had no explanation for it. He already knew, as everyone did then, that there was, uh, there was a great variety of forms within any given species, whether dogs or cattle or pigeons or pea plants, since he was a botanist. But no one yet had any explanation for how units of information were inherited from father or mother or how they were alternately expressed in the young, nor could anyone then imagine how new traits emerged in any descendant variety that didn't already exist in their parents. What we now, you know, these are what we now know to be mutations. They didn't yet understand how plants and animals could become so diverse. And they didn't understand the mechanisms to explain how crossbreeding worked. They just knew that it worked. They didn't know how it worked. And crossbreeding only works within different morphs or breeds within a single species. In Linnaeus's time and in his mindset, there was no bridge between the species no point where two closely related populations could diverge to the point that they could no longer interbreed. A different species could sometimes produce infertile hybrids if they were in the same genus, but hybridization generally could not occur between different genera, even in the same family. Yet the Linnaean taxonomic tree required speciation, the emergence of new species, which he believed could only come about as an act of special, supernatural, i.e. magical, creation by God. And to put that another way, uh, Linnaeus and the people of his day could accept microevolution variation within a species, but they could not accept macroevolution, which is variation between species, beginning with the emergence of new species. 
Now, later on, but later in his life, he realized that speciation had to be happening, but he couldn't figure out how, and he died with this, his greatest enigma, still unanswered. Then a century or so later, Darwin provided an explanation on the origin of species by means of natural selection. And following that landmark realization, the mechanism of natural selection has been observed in operation many times in different ways. And that was just the first working mechanism of evolution. We now know of several others as well. Genetic drift, for example, is arguably more prominent, always in operation in the back end, but natural selection acting on it makes it deterministic. And computer models have shown that natural selection, uh, this combat or actually this combination of mechanisms playing out over many generations of population mechanics, reacting to environmental dynamics, uh, can produce patterns of emergent complexity and incidental designs far beyond the capacity of intelligent designers. And once we knew that speciation could happen, folks began observing that in, in real time, on top of many other ways that we can now confirm these relationships at any given taxonomic level. For example, what was originally nested only in morphology, the, you know, the, the study of the physical form, is now a twin nested hierarchy with the inclusion of genetics as well, like uh, following two sets of footprints back to where they once walked as one. So we know we're on the right track. Accepting evolutionary science does not equate to a conflict between theism and atheism. Many of the pioneers and champions of evolutionary theory have been Bible-believing Christians. The issue is whether you adhere to biblical literalism or whether you will accept that some portions of your favorite scriptures, you know, whether it's the Quran or what have you, may only be metaphorical. Because even if there really is a God, evolution would still be a demonstrable, inescapable fact of population genetics, fossils, and phylogeny, and the various scriptures that were penned by men and blamed on gods would still be false if interpreted literally. Not even the existence of God would change either of these facts. The problem is that religion reverses everything, and there's always some religious people who pretend as, as if, we, if we don't know everything, then we don't know anything at all. And they say this while simultaneously pretending to know what no one even can know. It's always been that some willfully ignorant, irrational idiots imagine that they know better than even the experts, even about subjects that they've never studied, because they believe so fervently in a book that most of them have never read. The Quran, for example, uh, doesn't say much about creation. Whoever wrote that book simply assumes that everyone is already familiar with the creation myth in the book of Genesis, wherein the Bible talks about different kinds of plants and animals, and it describes kinds according to whether they are able to interbreed to produce fertile offspring to bring forth after their kind. Thus, the, the Hebrew word min means exactly the same thing as the biological species concept. And modern creationists, being forced to accept some level of taxonomy but desperate to reject the rest, have tried to redefine that. And they've tried to misdefine macroevolution, too, and other relevant terms as well. But neither science nor scripture supports their attempts to move the goalposts to change what these words have always meant. The leaders of most, if not all, creationist ministries now accept that speciation happens which means that they accept macroevolution by definition, though they will never admit that. And they accept, nat they accept natural selection as an evolutionary mechanism leading to speciation. So they literally accept Darwin's account on the origin of species by means of natural selection. Yet they pretend that to reject what they erroneously label as Darwinism, not understanding what that word means either. They have no argument against evolution at all, and nothing to promote a mystical creation or conjuration either. All they can ever do is point so far back into the misty past beyond evolution to the origins of life or to some notion of universal beginnings, things we don't understand nearly as well, to pretend as if we don't know, therefore magic. As if the unexplained is explained by God. As if their magic imaginary designer is the default assumption when such is not even possible, much less probable, nor in any way indicated. They have to show that there's a there there, something to show that there's at least some reality to whatever they, they expect us to believe. Evolution, on the other hand, is demonstrably real, 
we know that if you take one original population and divide them, say on different sides of some natural boundary, like a wasteland, that soon enough you'll find a lone wanderer in the no man's land between them that you'll be able to recognize just by looking at it which group it came from. Because these now separate populations continually produce their own unique mutations that are not shared with the other group anymore because there's no more gene flow between them. Population genetics means that the parent gene pool tends to restrict new variants and blend it back in. But the smaller the community, the more likely that new traits will be expressed and spread through that population generations down the road. Until you have a discernible, until you have discernible subsets where every member of this group shares common traits that are not shared with any member of the sister group. And if they can still interbreed and produce fertile offspring, then that is a subspecies distinction. But if the, the, more, the more diverse each collective genome becomes, the more they grow apart genetically, the less likely they are to be physically or chemically compatible. And the higher the probability that their progeny will not be fertile or even viable until finally, they are each their own genetically isolated species. At that point, the leash is off. The old gene pool imposes no influence at all anymore. And thus speciation is the only taxonomic distinction that has a consistent definition being, you know, at least among sexually reproductive animals. And the only way that this diversity occurs is by evolutionary mechanisms. That accounts for the whole of taxonomy, all of it at every level. And if you take time to look at it in detail, you'll see that we can watch evolution happening manipulate, trace it, confirm it conclusively with multiple lines of evidence, overlapping evidence tracking back hundreds of millions of years. Consequently, evolution is not a religion since it neither posits nor prohibits belief in a supernatural soul transcending the death of the physical body. There is no support for that anywhere, nor is there any need for it in any field of science, nor even a philosophy. There is no rule against it either. Science does, however, have a rule against faith, because all postulations must be based on prior evidence and all claims must be testable and potentially falsifiable, because there has to be some way to know whether it's true or not. But you don't necessarily have to prove that it's wrong, not if there's something to indicate that, not if there was nothing to indicate that there's even a possibility that it might be right. It's like being on trial for a crime. I don't know how it is in all other countries. But an American court trial can prove guilt, but they can't prove you innocent. We can only declare that you're not guilty. We can't prove anything absolutely either. Uh, that only happens in mathematics. But in a court of law, as in science, an overwhelming preponderance of evidence, it can effectively prove something beyond reasonable doubt. Hitchens Razor says that positive claims require positive evidence and that what is asserted without evidence may be dismissed without evidence. There must be some way to know whether it is supported or not supported, which is the same as being declared not guilty. It means there's no discernible truth to the allegation. Thus, whatever is not supported is effectively the same as being disproved. It means that there isn't sufficient evidence to warrant further consideration, much less declaration. So don't tell me to disprove what was never indicated. Come back when you can make a case for those things without having to pretend as if we don't already know what we can show that we really do know.